All right, well, it's really uh, uh, wonderful to be up, up here with um, uh, my friend and uh, collaborator, Thomas Lamb, who I've, I've known for about five, five years now. Um, and I think uh, Thomas and I are up here to um, illustrate yet another aspect of this, uh, of this grand structure uh, out there, um, this mathematical structure in, in the universe, um, which is perhaps exemplified by the fact that if you were to ask either one of us, uh, I don't know, five, ten years ago, whether we'd be uh, up here on the stage as uh, talking about the relationship between mathematics and physics, I think we'd both uh, tell you you're totally nuts. Uh, this is definitely not something I ever imagined um, I would be doing with my life. When I first came to the Institute around 11 years ago, I just spent two years um, where uh, my dominant collaborators were talking, the collaborations were talking with people like Kyle, experimental particle physics. This is something I imagine I would be doing uh, more and more when I came here. Um, I suspect uh, 10 years ago you didn't think, Thomas, that you'd be spending much time talking to a physicist. Uh, neither one of us are professionals at this mathematical, uh, at this interface between mathematics and physics. Um, I'm not a mathematical physicist by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a physicist who loves mathematics. That's not, not the same thing. Um, and, uh, uh, and yet, uh, uh, here we are. My, my main collaborators uh, over the past five years have been uh, mathematicians. Um, so. Uh, I think what we'd like to talk about is what it is that uh, drew us together, just as a vignette, as an example of um, uh, life uh, at this math physics uh, uh, frontier. Um, and uh, just to, to talk kind of abstractly about what we're going, uh, the, the points we're, we're going to illustrate, um, uh, any such interaction, and especially the sort of interaction that, uh, uh, that brings people uh, who didn't think they'd be doing this um, uh, uh, to be interacting with each other. Um, I should say another interesting aspect of this is uh, this is an example where neither physics nor mathematics is particularly ahead. Just independently as physicists and mathematicians, we found ourselves running into virtually identical uh, objects from radically different points of view. And so it's, 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 uh, uh, it's a kind of an amazing and delightful shock to both of us that, that, uh, that this has happened and it's fruitful to a pursue. But to begin with, something has to bring you together. And the thing that brings you together uh, is the observation that some structure A that's somehow connected describing the physical universe is connected, maybe in a surprising way, to some mathematical structure X uh, in the universe of mathematical ideas. And this is already interesting to try to understand why this happened and to establish this link uh, 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 better and better. Um, but once you see that this happens, it's the beginning of a kind of fruitful interplay that you can have between the two subjects because to the physicist, A never comes alone. <clears throat> structure A is part of something that's supposed to describe the physical universe. And so those uh, structures and ideas can be related to other things. They can be related to bigger ideas and structures B or even smaller things C. Um, but once you know that there's a link between A and X, given that A is related to B and C on the side of the physical universe, it strongly suggests that there should be something on the other side, <laughs> some correspondence between uh, B and C as well on the side of the mathematical universe. So that's something that, uh, that, that, that uh, the physicist understanding and familiar with the, with the physical universe has to offer the mathematician. But of course it goes the other way as well. Um, the mathematician might realize that structure X is connected to uh, mathematical structures Y and Z, and that suggests that there should be some analog of those connections on the side of the physical uh, universe as well. So that's what we're going to uh, illustrate in a number of examples. Um, in this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, and so let's just jump right into it. Uh, uh, the physics that we're talking about is very basic physics. It happens in the real world all the time. Uh, um, and it involves the collisions of uh, constituents of the nucleus of the atom, uh, the collisions of particles like protons. So uh, this happens uh, gajillions of times a second with protons um, in, in, in cosmic rays banging into uh, uh, protons in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, it also happens when we collide protons at the Large Hadron Collider, a picture that you've seen a number of times already. Now, protons are not elementary particles. They're made out of smaller constituents uh, called quarks that are held together inside the proton by imaginatively named particles called gluons. And so what we're really interested in when protons smash into each other um, is uh, studying the collisions between these underlying sort of point-like elementary particles, the uh, quarks and the gluons. And this is something that's actually practically important to do for experiments at the, uh, at the LHC in order to uh, uh, compare the predictions of theory and experiment. 
Now, there is a time-honored way of uh, proceeding um, to figure out what happens when you collide, let's say, two gluons inside the proton. Two gluons inside the proton come along, all sorts of things can happen, but you might be interested for the probability for two gluons to come in, the probability or the so-called amplitude for two gluons to come in, and three gluons to uh, go out. And what you're supposed to do, you learn in textbooks, is draw these little pictures that go back to Richard Feynman, that represents all the different ways that two gluons could have come in and hit each other and produced three out this way, that way, that way, zillions of different ways, and you have to add them all up together. Um, a crucial element of these pictures I want to emphasize is that these gluons sort of come in and go out. Actually, the experimentalists don't see real gluons uh, uh, coming out. They see jets of strongly interacting particles going out. But anyway, this is the sort of basic underlying process. Uh, but uh, inside here are things that, that are sort of a, more of a theoretical f fiction. We call them virtual particles. They're not things that sort of propagate in and out from long distances. They're virtual particles that occur as intermediate steps in these calculations. And the presence of these virtual particles means that despite the fact that the rules for writing down each one of these pictures is incredibly simple, the final answer turns out to be tremendously complicated looking, uh, naively anyway. So a result of a brute force calculation literally for this process is kind of 30 complicated pages that looks like this. And yet around a little over 30 years ago, some theoretical physicists realized that in fact if you add up all of these things, the final answer turns into just one a single term. I'm not going to explain what these symbols mean. They're a representation of the energies and the momentum of the particles involved, but everything collapses to a single term. And so something many people have been trying to understand for a number of years is where this simplicity comes from. Why is the answer so much simpler than you would have naively expected? And you go back to the kind of simplest possible processes that could involve these gluons. The, um, so you imagine the very simplest possible interaction between elementary particles is where three of them meet at a point in space and time. Uh, the gluons have a property called spin or polarization, and so there's two kinds of ways that, that uh, uh, that three of them can meet, where two of them have negative polarization or negative helicity and one has a positive or the other way around. These turn out to be incredibly simple. Um, and so you can just uh, begin by asking, if, I, if, if instead of imagining I have virtual particles, I forget about virtual particles, but I glue these most simple possible processes together where I eliminate the idea of virtual particles and just play around what would happen. And you start playing around and you realize that if you glue these little pictures together with black and white vertices, just this single picture, just a single picture which has eliminated the notion of virtual particle gives you that simple final answer um, instead of the sum of 30 complicated pages of algebra. So that's something that a number of us ran into, these sort of fascinating pictures with black and white vertices. And the beginning of the interaction with uh, our mathematician friends is that they had also seen these pictures in another setting. And maybe Thomas can tell, tell us something about that. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me first echo uh, Nima and say I'm not trained as a mathematical physicist. I'm, I'm a combinatorialist, which uh, may be unusual for this room. Um, I think uh, Karen Ullenbeck said uh, many mathematicians don't understand quantum field theory or find it hard to understand. No, I'm one of them. Um, uh, so, so let me say something about my area. Um, to explain a bit about combinatorics, this, uh, this picture gives a very simple, one of the most basic combinatorial objects. Um, so uh, uh, this is a picture of a permutation. Um, so a permutation is, um, is a reordering of a bunch of numbers. So in this case, the numbers one up to five. Um, uh, so we can think of it as um, over here, they're ordered one up to five, and then we send one to three, two to five, and so on, and that's a permutation. Um, it turns out that uh, you can get a permutation um, from one of these pictures that uh, Nima described. Um, so one of these pictures with uh, black and white dots. Um, so so the, the rule to get this permutation is you label the sort of external legs uh, with the numbers one up to n, in this case five. Um, and then you have to follow, you follow a path through this graph and you follow these things called the rules of the road. Um, the, the rules are if you're at a, at a black vertex, you always turn right. And if you're at a white vertex, you turn left. Um, so if you follow, if you follow uh, these paths, um, uh, so this uh, purple, this purple uh, path starts at one and turns right at the black vertex, left at white, right at black, left at white, and it goes to three. Um, 
Um, so the first part of data in the permutation is one goes to three. And you repeat this for every vertex and you'll get a permutation. So this is, this is a, 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 a basic thing in combinatorics that sort of re relates, to, uh, it relates to basic things in combinatorics, permutations and these bicolored graphs. Um, though actually this particular th um, construction is, is actually not, uh, not that old. It's, it's maybe the last uh, 15 years. Um, um, so uh, one thing in combinatorics that uh, we, we do with uh, such a bicolored uh, graph, so a, a picture with these um, black dots and white dots, is we want to build a space out of them. And the way we build a space out of them, um, there's, a, there's an intermediate step, which, which is that from one of these uh, pictures, we'll build a matrix. And um, the, analogy, uh, the analogy is, um, suppose, I, suppose I've got a, I want to, um, describe a triangle and I'm trying to describe a point inside the triangle, then we often think of the point as some sort of combination of the vertices of the triangle. So it's like oh, maybe a third of this one, um, uh, half of this one, and a sixth of this one. Um, and uh, we can write down um, uh, uh, sort of um, working, working projectively what we, what we think is we draw, we draw um, sort of coordinate axes for each of these um, vertices and we think of the uh, think of this um, uh, pink or purple purple point in the center of the triangle as some combination of these coordinates and in this case 1 7 13 some kind of combination and um, the what these bicolored graphs do for us is that they allow us to generalize this construction to something called the positive Grossmannian um, uh, which is some similar kind of construction where instead of getting just a row of numbers we'll get this matrix of numbers and the rule, the rule is extremely, extremely simple, but also surprisingly recent, uh, defined only uh, very recently, um, last, last 15 to 20 years, is you, you take a matrix and you just ask that all the, all the determinants are positive. So one, so one times three minus two times zero is positive. Two times four minus, minus five times three is positive and so on. And this describes some kind of space. Um, and, and, um, and there's a, non-obvious question, which is what does the space look like? But if you did this, if you did this construction with sort of one by something matrices, you would get a, you would get a triangle or some simplex. Okay, so, so Nima explained that um, in this uh, basic uh, gluon scattering picture, there were two simplest kind of interactions which correspond to this uh, black dot uh, with sort of three, uh, three legs. And another one with a white, which is a white dot with three legs, um, and sort of. Um, uh, so these are our most basic objects, and and sort of by definition, we um, assign to the black dot this particular um, matrix, which is which is sort of has two free parameters x and y, and you can think of this as a triangle. Um, uh, this uh, and assigning to this white dot, we assign this two by three matrix. Um, also with two parameters and also a triangle, but a dual kind of triangle. And then there's a, there's a game we play with, um, when you give me this big graph, there's a way to glue these, uh, glue, as we glue the vertices together, we can also glue the matrices together and build a big matrix. Um, and to, um, and this is the, an example, so these A, B, C, D are sort of um, parameters assigned to the edges here. Um, that aren't written. Um, so we can glue a, a big matrix um, out of this graph. And um, one thing to quickly say is that the permutation, the really basic combinatorial operation I said earlier, which is um, assigning a permutation to a bicolored graph, this is actually an operation that's probably familiar. It's, it's essentially t giving the information of how to do row reduction on this matrix. So when you apply row reduction on this matrix, you get some ones in certain positions, the pivot ones, and the location of those is equivalent to the information of this permutation. Um, in technical terms, it's, it's the, the permutation describes the Bruja stratification. Um, okay. So you might think that, uh, uh, that, uh, that it's just sort of coincidental that both sets of people find these uh, funny graphs with black and white vertices. But in fact, um, as we as physicists, and then in, in, in interaction more and more uh, with the mathematicians uh, studying these things realize, the proper way to do this physical calculation, uh, 
that actually gets you these simple final answers. The really correct way of understanding physically how to glue these things together directly leads you to this way of gluing, should be thought of as this particular way of gluing the basic matrices together, uh, which have this positivity property, into a more complicated matrix that continues to have that positivity property. So these things aren't, uh, they're not capriciously related to each other, they're deeply related to each other, they in fact end up being uh, exactly the same thing. So this is an example of the structure A uh, related to gluon scattering in the real world out there. Um, connected to uh, something rather mysteriously connected to combinatorics and these uh, funny spaces that are generalizations that, uh, of, of triangles into, into somewhat more uh, abstract places. Um, so that we, we, we've established our surprising link between uh, two worlds. But now we can give an illustration of the example that, that, uh, that, that the physicist knows that there has to be more going on. Um, and that's if we go, I gave you the simplest process with two particles coming in and three particles going out. If it turns out, if it turns out if you go already the next most complicated process with let's say three particles going in and three going out, or two going in and four going out, that, that is not represented by a single one of these pictures. So a single one of these pictures are associated with these simple geometric spaces. But the actual final answer that you get, and again, in leading order of uh, approximation, ends up uh, being the sum of two pictures like this. Now, uh, to our mathematician friends, this plus sign didn't make too much sense. It was not so obvious uh, how to combine these two uh, different pictures together into one bigger object. And yet, as physicists, we knew there had to be something there, because physics cares about the final answer only, and not about a particular way of breaking it up into more elementary pieces. So that's why we were confident that something had to exist to extend these geometric ideas to something larger that kind of took as elementary building blocks these little pieces that we had before, but somehow glued them together. And, and after a while, a sort of picture began to emerge that we should think of these total uh, processes as being associated, in a sense, with the volume of some geometric shape that's determined by the data specifying the energies and the momenta and the helicities of these gluons. So you give me the energies and momenta and the helicities of gluons, I draw this geometric shape, and I need to compute its volume. But you see, one way to compute its volume is to break it up into two simpler pieces, that little tetrahedron at the top and this little tetrahedron at the bottom. And each one of these turned out precisely to be associated with one of these pictures. And in fact, you could do it another way. You could do it as a sum of three tetrahedra going around, and that would be yet another representation of the answer in these uh, interesting terms. So that suggested that there had to be some general, some generalization of, these, uh, of, of this idea of the positive Grassmannian. And indeed, just like triangles could be generalized into this more abstract space in the way that Thomas described to give us the positive Grassmannian, then there is another natural generalization of the notion of a, of a triangle. You can sort of glue triangles together into polygons, or you can glue tetrahedra together into, uh, into, into shapes that are called polyhedra or polytopes more, more generally. And if you extend, if you generalize these ideas into this more abstract space in exactly the same way as we did with triangles, then you get an, an interesting new mathematical object. And there is one more procedure that you have to do to it to, in order to uh, get yet another geometric uh, object that incorporates the, uh, the more subtle effects of uh, quantum mechanical, um, uh, of quantum mechanical um, uh, corrections to these uh, processes. So this was an example of something that was, uh, uh, that was new to the mathematicians. Um, uh, I think um, maybe, Thomas, you can say something about at least one, how natural one part of this uh, uh, generalization actually is. Right, I mean, if we, uh, so, so this picture here going from the triangle to the uh, uh, pentagon, um, uh, um, you can get any n gone out of the constructions that are extremely natural to Nehmer and in, in physics, but uh, back uh, in sort of, uh, in Greek mathematics, there was a um, study, of, already the study of sort of three-dimensional solids, for example, things like uh, tetrahedra, cubes, octahedra, um, there's, a, there's a natural uh, higher dimensional version of these objects, and it's curious that the um, constructions, um, constructions from um, physics only leads to sort of one particular, um, one particular kind of shape in, in sort of high dimensions, kind of a positive uh, shape. And um, there's, a, there's, a natural, uh, there's a natural analogy to search for, to search for um, different, different shapes in, in high dimensions which are um, uh, uh, 
analogs of these uh, um, ones motivated by physics. As far as I know, these um, Grassmann polytropes, um, uh, we don't know what physics goes with them. Okay. Yeah, uh, and I think I'd say that, that this is a, a, uh, another example of this uh, phenomenon. This, this object, I think, is extremely, extremely natural. I think it's a complete historical accident that we ran into a version of it before, uh, uh, before the mathematicians did. Um, uh, but here, too, physics keeps going. There is, an, there is a further richer ex extension of these things, which I think still um, is not something so obviously you guys right, would have right. uh, talked about. Um, but, but having started exploring it a little bit mm -hmm. together, they, they seem to be interesting. Um, uh, let's talk about uh, another set of examples illustrating uh, uh, similar themes, but uh, in, in, in these examples, it'll, um, we'll see more of the inspiration from existing structures in mathematics telling us to look for uh, uh, corresponding structures in physics, and actually a, a lot of back and forth. So we'll just really go over this part a little more quickly. Um, this is also to just give you a flavor of what we're actually doing. This is uh, related to things that uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas and I have been working on just over the past uh, year or so while he's been uh, visiting us here at the Institute. So uh, let's go back and talk about uh, another set of very basic processes, now not involving um, the gluons inside the proton, but involving other kinds of particles, actually very, very general sorts of processes, but for the sake of this discussion, you might imagine it's sort of scattering that will involve Higgs particles or uh, other particles um, that we're familiar with in particle physics called uh, pions. And one very basic aspect of what these collisions look like is that special things happen. If you have sort of two particles going in and four particles going out, then a physicist is very used to thinking about uh, the more special situations where the way this happened is that really secretly four of them came in and made a fifth particle that propagated some distance before decaying into two of them. Or three came in and produced a middle one that propagated some distance before de decaying back out the three of them. And then you could keep going down and, and seeing the same thing happening here. So these four things producing a fifth, while well, something more special could have happened um, uh, by realizing that that occurred when first two produced a third one that decayed, to this, uh, uh, that decayed to this guy and that guy that decayed to this guy and that guy that propagated some distance and decayed in this way. So this way of organizing uh, more and more special processes uh, is something that's sort of uh, mother's milk and bread and butter for uh, physicists. But uh, something that I think um, none of us, uh, no physicists, uh, certainly expected is that exactly these same pictures can actually be organized in a totally different way. And this is something that's been known to mathematicians since the 1960s. So do you want to say something about this picture, Thomas? Uh, yeah, so, so the isohedron is this, uh, is this again, again, polytope where um, uh, you have uh, in this, this three-dimensional object where you arrange all of these uh, all of these graphs as vertices and the, the edges joining them, if they, um, uh, if they differ just by this kind of uh, local transformation where you have, you take an edge, you contract it, and then you expand it out in a um, different way. And you draw all these edges. Um, uh, it's interesting that when this was first discovered, it was discovered in, in topology, um, uh, it was described just as sort of uh, as a collection of adjacencies rather than being embedded into space, which I think makes it interesting for the next slide. Uh, yeah, and, and just, just, just to say again, I mean, the, the, the fact that you should care about how things are related by, these, by going from a general to a more special process is definitely something that physicists care about. But it never occurred to us to imagine drawing these things in a shape and even seeing that they're realized as, uh, as some, uh, that this network of relationships of of, uh, of more and more special ways in which these complicated collisions could occur uh, can actually be organized in this, uh, in this uh, geometrical way. Now, uh, this, uh, as, uh, as Thomas said, has been known um, just abstractly as a graph like this has been known since the uh, 1960s. Um, but uh, but uh, once it sort of penetrated our heads in the correct way, and given the story that we just saw with the collision of gluons, it was clear that there should be some cousin of this, uh, that, that this, this older and more uh, uh, familiar mathematical object should be uh, describable in the same kind of language with, that we use to, des uh, to describe um, uh, the story of the amphitohedron and gluons. And that led um, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some of us a number of years ago to a very specific realization of this uh, basic combinatorial shape. With a, you see, it has a, this is a very specific shape. Uh, some of these sides are parallel. It, it's not, uh, it has exactly the same kind of uh, um, 
uh, it has the same kind of shape and same kind of combinatorial rules as this one, but as a more specific, uh, it's a more specific version of it. And in fact, this way of constructing this object that was uh, motivated and inspired by physics is not exactly one of the standard ones that the right, mathematicians right. Uh, knew about, um, even though this object has been studied by mathematicians for, uh, for quite a while. But now the story goes back to mathematics because um, mathematicians look at these pictures that are super duper familiar to physicists and they do something else with them which is not familiar to the physicists. So you want to say something about it? Yeah, so, so the, basic, uh, the basic combinatorial description of, of, these, of these edges here is this move here where you sort of contract an edge and expand it out in a different way. Um, and, and this move, uh, sort of, again, sort of somewhat recently, last, last 20 years, has been, um, uh, uh, has gotten the name of mutation and is part of a, a big subject now um, called cluster algebras, um, where here, here's, a, here's a picture of um, where uh, the, usually the, this operation of mutation is described uh, on this uh, pink graph rather than the black graph, um, and uh, starting with some, um, sort of what's called a quiver on the, on this pink graph, um, we can sort of mutate at a particular vertex and then produce a, a new one. And um, this leads to a theory of uh, cluster algebras, which is, a, um, which is an algebraic object that you build out of these um, mutations. And there's a whole zoo, a really, really big zoo of these cluster algebras. Yeah, yeah in fact, uh, uh, maybe you can say something about the classification of, uh, of uh, these guys. Well, I mean, that, uh, I guess uh, in the last 15 years or so, it was realized that, uh, that, that this zoo comes in two, two types, the sort of finite type, uh, where, where the algebra is finite, and everything else where the, where the algebra is uh, infinite. Um, and uh, these pictures will be extremely familiar to both physicists and mathematicians. We've seen these pictures in many, many other places uh, before. Um, uh, this finite set already comes in two different types. Um, uh, a kind of a general type, uh, sometimes known as a classical type, in some a few exceptional cases, um, and uh, so uh, so these objects exist. Now uh, we already saw that there's a connection between the simplest type of, of of picture and the physics of the collision of Higgs particles in the simplest possible way, where you get uh, pictures that look like trees. Uh, but, so now we have an example, though, of the phenomenon that, uh, that A is related to all these other things uh, in the mathematical universe. And so that, that means that surely there should be some role for the rest of these things in physics. And so you can go and look and see if it's true. And indeed it's true that if you look at these other uh, classical type cases anyway, that they, they are also related to the scattering process in ways that are surprising to us, that we would not, definitely not have thought of um, ourselves. Uh, uh, without being nudged in the correct direction uh, by the existence of these cousin structures. And then there's lots of uh, open questions, again, going back and forth. Uh, all these exceptional ones, uh, do they have any role to play in physics? We, we don't know. On the other hand, in physics, there are even more complicated processes and involve more and more loops here. And it's clear they should have some kind of connection with the world of cluster algebras, but if they do, it has to involve these more mysterious infinite type ones. Um, there's an infinity there that the cluster people uh, know and love, but the analog of that infinity does not exist on this side. So it suggests that if there is some connection here, it should give us some way of taming or at least thinking about these infinities in a new way. And it just keeps going and going. I'll just, uh, just give one final example. Uh, something else that physicists love to do is to start with a picture of, uh, of uh, particles and uh, actually think of this as a special case of, um, or uh, uh, a case of looking from very, very far away of thinking in terms of strings instead. So the, you can imagine the particles are little uh, loops of string. And if we look at the, um, uh, so, so this is a very natural generalization in physics. Well, when you start with this mathematical structure on the side of the cluster algebras, it has a, it has a very natural, um, they're, they're very natural objects associated with it that actually directly give you this picture of open strings first from which you have to take a limit to go back to the picture of particles. So that's, that's extremely interesting. And given that that exists on the side of the, of the cluster algebras, you wonder what it means for all these other guys. Uh, so they're somehow associated with uh, a generalization of these pictures of uh, particles and strings that we're trying to understand. Um, on the other hand, th this doesn't stop from the side of physics. We go from this little picture of open strings to a picture of little closed loops of strings colliding with each other. And that, that does not so obviously have uh, an, an existing uh, uh, 
uh, an existing understanding in the world of, uh, of uh, cluster algebras. And in fact, their existence suggests that there should be some new geometries in the land of cluster algebras. And uh, that's something that indeed we're finding and are starting to explore. So this is an example of the interplay going back and forth now a number of times, right? Where you just jump back and forth, something in physics, you see something in math, or something in math is connected to a few things, so there should be something in physics. Is there? Yes, there is. Uh, but then there should be that too. Is it there on the other side? This exists, that doesn't exist. And so we just hop back and forth, back and forth. Um, and uh, this is all about uh, some extremely basic physics and as, as I hope you see, also some extremely basic um, uh, mathematics. And this is a sort of force of, of, um, of this uh, mathematical structure out there in the universe that brings people like uh, uh, um, non-professionals like Thomas and I <laughs> into a collision on this kind of, um, uh, in, in this kind of area. Uh, I just want to end with a, with a few general, um, uh, a, a few general uh, remarks. Um, first, maybe Thomas, you could uh, you could uh, you could share your your sort of broad perspective on on this interaction between uh, physics and the combinatorics, where it fits into the uh, in the historical arc of, of your own subject. Yeah. So so I uh, I work in what I think of as the structural side of combinatorics. So algebraic combinatorics, geometric combinatorics, topological combinatorics, um, and what's uh, surprising to me is how broad this interaction is and how many different parts of the combinatorics that I study actually appears in, in these stories that uh, we've been talking about. Um, so we've already mentioned polytopes, which is one of, I mean, goes back to the Greeks. Um, and uh, another subject that appears um, uh, uh, is Schubert calculus, which um, comes up because we have these uh, matrices which uh, describe points in, um, in Grassmannians and, um, and this leads to a geometry uh, of Schubert calculus, but also, um, also other facets that come up are extremely new parts of combinatorics. Um, so uh, two of them we've mentioned are, are really, really quite new, um, sort of within the last 20 years. Are, uh, um, cluster algebras were uh, discovered around uh, 20 years ago, and it, it's, it's coming up, though it's also cluster algebras appear in, in physics in, in a number of places. Um, and then total positivity, which really sort of developed in combinatorics. Um, the definition has been around for a long time, but total positivity came in sort of really developed in combinatorics in a lot in the last 20 years. So it's really exciting to see that actually a lot of old, old ideas and a lot of new ideas are, um, are coming together. Yeah, and, and I'd say it's, it's not obvious where these ideas uh, that, that, fit in the, in, in, the, in the world of physics, actually. Um, we keep seeing them in various isolated places. Uh, they're somehow deeply related to the very basic things about physics. They're, they're deeply related to, to, to processes and phenomenon that we normally talk about by making the principles of space-time and the principles of quantum mechanics completely manifest. But their way of talking about those uh, principles and phenomenon were um, uh, in, in somehow a different way using more, more primitive underlying structures. And um, just, I'd say, in the last sort of uh, five years or so, we're seeing a few more examples uh, here or there of, of the same kind of ideas showing up in very different, in, in very different parts of uh, physics uh, as well. And um, I, I'd like to ju just end by uh, just saying a few things about what the day-to-day -day interaction looks like between uh, physicists and uh, mathematicians. There's a kind of a cliche about how physicists and mathematicians uh, talk to each other that, um, uh, that uh, physicists uh, um, are these non-rigorous people who don't, sort of don't care about proving anything and on the one side, and uh, mathematicians are obsessed with rigorous minutiae on the other side. Um, and I've found this to be not true at all. I've, I've found this not to be characteristic of our interaction um, uh, at all. In fact, the, the sort of data, the, the culture is ex extremely similar. Um, I think there's, there's one interesting difference that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's maybe worth uh, saying a, a little bit about, um, uh, which is that uh, mathematician, once you've figured out there's something interesting going on, you're trying to establish a, a, a more of a connection between the uh, subjects, um, uh, um, pretty soon the mathematicians are, are interested in giving precise definitions to the kind of objects that you're talking about. And the physicist is nervous to do this and resists making precise definitions of uh, anything, um, partially because uh, there's always something bigger that, uh, that, that's going on in physics, and so you're, you're nervous about committing too early to uh, some, some final definition of, uh, of uh, something. Um, 
Uh, but this, this difference in attitude is, is a source of a kind of a fascinating creative tension um, uh, between us in, uh, in uh, collaboration. Maybe you can say a little bit about what our attitude is good for for you guys. And I can yeah, say yeah, a little about absolutely. I, so, so Nima likes to keep things fluid and, and while, while I, I like to nail, nail down the uh, definitions precisely right away and, and um, I think, um, I think uh, physicists um, uh, that I've talked to, they're very sensitive to interesting mathematical phenomena. So, so when I talk to Nima, he knows that something's going on. He can't, sometimes he can't sort of formalize in a mathematical language uh, exactly what is going on, but there's something interesting going on. And so when I talk to um, uh, physicists, I think it's extremely fruitful when we discuss phenomena that there's no existing mathematical formalism, which is actually the case for some of these uh, new kinds of polytropes that came up. Um, earlier, the, the, the formalism didn't, didn't exist, but the phenomena were there, and um, I think that's uh, the part where I think um, the interaction between physics and mathematics is extremely sort of useful. And also, it's something that surprised me. Um, I had the sort of physicist chauvinist pig attitude about the relationship between our subject, but something that really su uh, surprised me over and over again in this interaction is the fruitfulness of coming up with precise definitions. And one reason is that, that uh, the other reason the physicists resist uh, giving things precise definitions is that we're a little bit scared of very singular situations. Um, uh, if you give a very precise definition, it has to work at every possible place and every possible setting. And physics is filled with things that always go wrong in some way or another if you're too, too precise. Uh, um, and yet, it has happened over and over again that actually um, committing and, uh, and giving precise definitions for things was helpful, in fact, crucial in many cases for uh, understanding the physics. All right, so I think we can leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you.